Okay, three, two, one, it's jam. What's up guys? In the last video, we talked about the materials on the Earth's surface like minerals and rock. And we talked about the things that can affect things on the surface that are external to the surface like water, wind, stuff like that. Now let's go in. We need to look inside the Earth to see the next processes that we can discuss. So, let's go. We talked about processes beyond the Earth's surface. Under the Earth's surface, on the other hand, we have endogenic processes. So this is change that comes from within the Earth. So what powers endogenic processes? How can so much energy be on Earth? And we already discussed this, actually. It's Earth's internal heat. It's the heat energy that came from primordial heat, or the heat when Earth was forming. Again, when we slept, smack, smack that Earth, smack that Earth, we get primordial heat from the Earth's formation and it getting hit by asteroids. Radiogenic heat is just a fancy term for the heat from radioactive decay. So your heavy metals and heavy elements uh, decaying into smaller things and releasing energy. So all of that contributes to Earth's internal heat. That's a lot of energy. So that energy can actually flow through the Earth in the form of conduction and convection mostly. So conduction is heat or energy transfer through solid layers. You can see here in the diagram that the inner core, the solid core, uh, uses conduction to you know move the heat through it and to the outer core. The outer core being liquid uses convection instead. So convection currents are currents from the flowing of material. So these convection currents carry you to the mantle. Now the mantle's weird, it's solid, we called it solid, but over geological time, again, it technically sort of acts as a fluid. So it still uses convection currents. These convection currents convey the energy to the crust, and then lots of stuff happens to the crust. Right? Okay, let's go. What happens to the crust? How does this heat, how does this energy affect the surface? So it causes lots of things. So first we have magmatism. It's the production and movement of magma. So it transfers energy to and from the surface because magma has a lot of energy. So it's produced, magma is produced by subducted or crust that got uh, taken down under the earth. So when crust uh, gets uh, pulled down, it gets melted by the heat and pressure of the earth and then it forms new magma which participates in the convection currents and transports energy to other places. So that about covers energy. What about the materials? How does, how does inner earth uh, affect the materials of outer surface earth? We have two theories. We have Plutonism. It's a theory that says that the current crust started out as intrusive igneous rocks, meaning the original crust of the earth was mostly magma and uh, weird stuff. So it formed an extrusive shell, but that was just a temporary shell. The intrusive igneous rocks that formed under that initial shell supposedly formed the new oceanic and continental crust. Most of the crust today, according to Plutonism, was made initially from intrusive igneous rocks that got processed through weathering and erosion, stuff like that. Volcanism is, on the other hand, the current crust starting out from extrusive igneous rocks, meaning volcanoes. Just spewing lava out, and then that lava solidified, and that's it. That's all. That's the initial crust. So these are two theories that are uh, still in debate, but mostly people believe in volcanism because it just it's just more intuitive for you know volcanoes to spew out lava, and then that's it. Plutonism says that there's a temporary shell first, and then it got uh, subducted, and then the uh, underneath shell is the one that formed the new crust. It's complicated. Either way, we ended up with rocks in the crust. But what happened to the crust when the energy was transferred to it? So when the crust was actually already formed, what happens when you put energy or force on it? It ends up with stress. So you put lots of energy, you put lots of force, it ends up with stress. There are many types of stress. The first is compression stress. It's when the crust is pushed together. So generally in compression stress, we create a convergent boundary because it's moving together. So we have structures like a crust fold on the left or a reverse fault. So a reverse fault, uh, again, it's when your uh, crust is moving together. And then you can see here that the um, layers are cracked and uh, there's a line in the middle because they're being pushed against each other and one is sliding above the other uh, piece of land. So that's for compression stress. Tension stress, on the other hand, is when the crust is pulled apart. So we create a divergent boundary. They're moving apart. Rift valleys are uh, 
very big uh, example of this. And normal faults are the fault lines at divergent boundaries. So you can see here, instead of being pushed above another layer, this one is being pulled beneath the other layer. Okay, that's a normal fault. All right, so that's two types of stress, uh, compression and tension. Shear stress is when the crust goes in different directions. So we have transform fault lines and strike slip faults. They're the same thing. So you can see it's basically the same thing in the left and right. I just didn't want to mess up the, uh, the uh, slide design. So anyway, shear stress causes transform boundaries or, trans or strike slip faults. So again, when we talk about the boundaries between land, they're uh, called transform. If we're, called, uh, if we're talking about the fault lines, strike slip. But generally, they're interchangeable. Scientists also get under their skin like that. Anyway, Earth's surface is under a lot of stress because of all the energy and pent-up force inside. But remember that it's all part of a cycle of creation and regeneration. So you might be going through some stress, through some conflict in your life because of COVID and online classes and family being weird and stuff. But remember that that stress doesn't need to destroy you. It can be part of the cycle of you being productive and creative and growing into someone more uh, alive and dynamic. Right? Don't let the stress break you. Make that stress a part of a productive life. But of course, don't forget to relax. All right? So let's relax. Let's end this video here. I'll see you guys. That is over.